Assalamu alaikum, be peace be upon you. My voice is louder, so I'll be <laughs> softly. Uh, welcome to the Abdullah William Mosque and Heritage Center. It's a great pleasure and honor to host all the organizations and attendees who've come to attend this meeting. Uh, and we'd like to thank you for your efforts for that. I'd like to... I remember a few things from the past which I would like to mention. The society was formed in 1999 by one of our elder statesmen, Dr. Akbar Early. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2014, just after the mosque was reopened. Uh, so please remember, remember him and all the others. Uh, there were several founding members. Uh, I'm the only one at the moment in the current uh, committee. Uh, Sister Sumaya, brother Rashid Maktir uh, are two who did a lot of work in the beginning to kickstart the organization. Uh, their brother Zia, who, who uh, was also in the forefront at that time, and many others, I can't recall the names, but I'd like to thank uh, uh, you know, and Brother Akbar Ali, of course, thank them all, or pray for them all, because some of them have passed away. Uh, in terms of housekeeping issues, you've got ex fire exit doors on my left side. There are three doors which lead out and back to the, here. or you can exit by the door that you came in. So there's plenty of uh, escape routes because this is a small room and it's quite handy to have all that uh, access. And I'd also like to thank, see this room is used for an event the first time. This was uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid's brain child only last week and in seven days this room has been totally rechanged and they have had sleepless nights every night for the last week. So I think we need to thank them for the efforts they've made. <laughs> There's a lot of volunteers involved in the process and they have done a lot of work way beyond what one would expect. We'd like to thank them and everybody else. <laughs> the food was Support supplied by Chris Ronnie, a Turkish restaurant in Liverpool. It was a pleasure having them, and I hope we will have uh, ongoing events with them and others. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Brother Mukmin Khan, who is the CEO of the Abdullah Khalim Society, who's going to introduce today's Quran reciter to us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. May peace and blessings be upon you all. Mumin Khan, I have been involved with the project from almost the beginning, not as a founding stage, but since 2002. So I've been the old school boy for 20 years now. Um, it is my great honor to welcome you all, and like I said, Mr. Khan, our chair, has thanked everybody, but there are a few I'd like to name very quickly. Dr. Abdul Hamid, who, like we said, is his brainchild, Dr. Brother Shagar, Hamza, um, and everyone else who have really worked hard. They haven't slept last night, and, and this room was ready about 10 minutes before you walked in, so you can imagine that. Um, I'd like to... Um, well, uh, our Imam had to go to, uh, sadly, his auntie passed away in Cardiff, in Allahi, in Allahi Rajun, and he can't be with us, so his teacher, Sheikh Sadek, will do the recitations, and the translation will be done by Dr. Didi. So may I please welcome Sheikh Sadek on stage. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال إبراهيم رب جعل هذا البلد آمنا واجنبني وبني أن نعبد الأصنام رب إنهن أضللن كثيرا من الناس فمن تبعني فإنه مني ومن عصاني فإنك غفور رحيم ربنا إني أسكنت من ذريتي بواد غير ذي زرع بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيم الصلاة فجعل أفئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون ربنا إنك تعلم ما نخفي وما نعلن وما يخفى على الله من شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء الحمد لله الذي وهب لي على الكبر إسماعيل وإسحاق إن ربي لسميع الدعاء رب جعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How beautiful is the Quran? How beautiful! Those of us who are not fortunate enough to understand the Quran, I have been asked to translate that. What Sheikh Allah has just uh, uh, recited, and it has been translated as below. Started with what is called Ibrahim, that I am, and and mention O Muhammad, when Ibrahim said, "My Lord, make this city that is Mecca secure and keep me and my sons away from worshiping idols." My Lord, indeed, they have led astray many amongst the people. So whoever follows me, then he is one of me. And whoever disobeys me, indeed, you are forgiving and merciful. Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house. Our Lord, that they may establish prayer, so make hearts among the people inclined towards them, and provide them from the fruits that they might be grateful. Our Lord, 
Indeed, you know what we conceal and what we declare, and nothing is hidden from Allah on the earth or in the heavens. Praise be to Allah who has granted to me in old age Ismail and Ishaq. Indeed, my Lord is the hero of supplication. My Lord, make me an establisher of prayer. And from my descendants, our Lord, and accept my supplication. And the last ayah he recited was Rabbana Firli Waliwali and onwards. And that has been translated as Our Lord, forgive me and my parents and the believers. The day account, uh, the account is established. Subhanallah, how beautiful is that? Thank you very much for the beautiful recitation and translation. Um, I'd like to now invite Dr. Altaf Qadir Khattak, who is advisor to the Abdullah Quilliam Society Trustees, who will address the audience. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Islam, Brother Yaya told me to be brief, but Pashtuns from the steppes between Afghanistan and Pakistan are not people who can be grief. They keep, keep on ranting, telling stories. That's how we are, you know. So, so if I'm not brief, then please do forgive me. The other thing which I want to do, I'll try my life best to be brief. In context of what we are here for today and the constellation of coming from Finland and coming from Ireland and coming from all over the places, and it reminded me of uh, a verse from Quran, chapter 49, verse 13. And Allah says, O mankind, we created you all from a single man and a single woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should recognize and know one another. In God's eyes, the most honorable of you are the ones most mindful of him. God is all knowing, all aware. So, cultural and racial diversity was a divine plan. It's not a curse, it's a blessing. Allah wanted us to be diverse because within diversity lies the potential for our humanity to mature and prosper and fully blossom. Singularity was not meant to be. In the whole creative process, diversity is at work. He is so creative that not a single fingerprint is the same among the billions and billions and billions of human beings. Some are yellow, some are brown, some are black, some are white. We speak different languages. We live in different societies. We have different cultures. We have different environments. We have different climates. Why? Implicit in this ayah, according to the sum of the scholars, is that instead of said, so that you may know each other, actual meaning is so that you may learn from each other. When I sit in the company of a Chinese and move on to sit in the company of an Englishman, and then move on to sit in the company of an Irishman, and then move on to sit in the company of an Arab, and move on to sit in the company of an African. I marvel 
I marvel at humanity, at its diversity. So here we are celebrating our humanity, our cultural diversity, our racial diversity in the unifying principles of Islam. That is the submission to one creator. But we will do it within our diversity. In Surah Al-Ankabut, Al the last verse Allah says, and I showed them my paths. So Bolona, he doesn't use a single path. He uses, Allah uses the word so Bolona, multiple paths to come towards me. We learn from each other. And I'll, Brother Yaya, yeah, is that enough or shall I carry on? No, <laughs> that's enough, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so, what I just want to say, this was one thing which was really, really, when my very, very dear friend for the last 25 years, Abdul Hamid, told me about this event. And I wanted to actually make a very sincere request that why don't we make it an annual event and we come together and celebrate our Islam within our diversity, cultural and racial diversity, the unifying force of Islam. And that in itself will provide an environment for all the, my English and Irish and Scottish and Welsh and Finnish Muslims to actually enjoy Islam within their cultural environment. And I'm finishing now. I met four Englishmen in Hajj. They were married to Iranians and Malaysian ladies. And I asked them that, so how do you feel? Each one of them said to me, it is fantastic. The brotherhood is fantastic. But can you imagine what they said? Dr. Khatak, we still miss our culture. So I request all of you, we have done our best to revive the legacy of Abdullah Quilliam, who believed in cultural and racial diversity within the unity of Islam. I request all my English and Irish and Scottish and Welsh and Finnish and whoever to now come forward and take this legacy forward to its deserving position that this place become the center of Islam, of English Islam, of European Islam, of British Islam, of Welsh Islam, of Irish Islam, of Scottish Islam. And we will come and join you. We are from the outside. You are the actual eyes of hell. Thank you very much. Once again, Jazakumullah khair to everybody from the Abdullah Quilliam Society for your words. And now finally, we're coming to the main attraction, which is the book launch of our Fatima of Liverpool, the Victorian woman who helped found British Islam. It's my pleasure to welcome the book's co-authors, Maulana Hamid Mahmoud, founder of Fatima Elizabeth Frontesteri, and Brother Yahya Burt, the community historian and one of the co-organizers of today's event. Brothers, if you'd like to come up, please, for your presentation. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al kareem amma ba'd. I want to begin by dedicating this book to Fatima Elizabeth Cates, rahimahullah herself, who was described fondly in the Crescent as a pious woman, a true wife, an adoring mother, a woman who fulfilled, if ever one did, God's mission on earth. I personally first read about Fatima Elizabeth Cates in 2010 
in Professor Ron Jeeves' book on Sheikh Abdullah William Henry Quilliam. I was taken aback by the passage which spoke of her conversion and the struggles she endured. As I read, I thought, why is it that I have never heard of Fatima Elizabeth before? Her story is moving, inspiring, and there's so much more we can learn from her life. And if I ever was to open a madrasa, I'd dedicate it in her name. Alhamdulillah, four years later, in 2014, our madrasa Fatima Elizabeth Frontistory was founded. In 2016, I contacted Professor Ron about researching the life of Fatima Elizabeth. He, however, tasked me to go on this journey and concluded his email with a prayer, may God guide you in your efforts. I mean, this led me for the next seven years to ad hoc research in archives, libraries, trying to trace the footsteps of Fatima, to even which led me to a castle and also in a cellar of a free Masonic lodge. And most of that didn't reach the book, unfortunately. However, trying to find Fatima's unmarked grave in a cemetery eight times the size of the Anfal football stadium was a challenge in itself. However, alhamdulillah, here we are gathered to commemorate together the life of Fatima Elizabeth Cates. And this has been the means for over a dozen convert organizations to come together from all over the country. And may Allah reward Fatima Elizabeth Cates for her efforts and for her struggle as an early Muslim in this country. So, who was Fatima Cates and where does her journey begin? Fatima was a temperance campaigner despite being 22 years old. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, okay, here we go. <clears throat> So Fatima was a temperance uh, campaigner. Despite her youth, she served as a secretary for the Birkenhead Workingmen's Temperance Association. And as part of that, in June 1887, William delivers a lecture, Fanatics and Fanaticism. However, for the Birkenhead audience, and Birkenhead temperance audience specifically, it was retitled The Arabian Teetotaler. And this is where he spoke about prominent reformers like William Wilberforce, who was the anti-slavery campaigner. And then he alluded to someone who occupied a far greater page in the history of the world. In fact, his position is unique, Quilliam said. He then began to speak about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. Fatima sat beside James Ali Hamilton, who had just also converted. And as she heard Quilliam's lecture, she turned towards him and said, I didn't know Mohammedans were teetotalers or that they didn't drink. I should like to know more about this religion. And following the lecture, she also had so many preconceptions about Islam and specifically about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she turned to Quilliam and said, isn't it true that the Muslim prophet said that women do not have souls and will not enter paradise. At once, Quilliam told her, no, that's not true. However, don't listen to what I have to say or what others tell you. Rather, read the matter for yourself. A few days later, Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam gives her his copy of the Quran, the 1734 translation by George Sale. Fatima, at this point, was only 22 years of age, unaware of the consequences of taking home the Quran and the impact it would have on her life. We go back in her life before continuing that story and I want to talk very briefly about her early life. So Fatima was born as Frances Elizabeth Murray on the 5th of January, 1865, in Birkenhead on the Wirral at 59 Henry Street, which is now just a car park. Okay. Um, this was a small village of only about 100 people in 1811. And by the time Francis was born in 1865, the population had grown to 14,000 people. Her father was John Murray, an Irishman. He was a porter at the newly built Birkenhead Market. 
Her mother, Agnes Mitchell, was from Edinburgh. Frances was the sixth, uh, the fifth of six children. Her father, however, died when she was only five. Frances would have, you know, she would have been the first generation of children to have benefited from the Elementary Education Act of 1870 and would have attended school at the age of five up to 12. 